I'm Dan Benjamin. I'm a behavioral economist and geno economist at the University of Southern California. Behavioral economics has grown from a movement that was at the, the fringes of economics, trying to bring psychological realism into economics from the 80s and 90s. And today, it has broken through into the mainstream of economics. I think it's been a, um, a tremendous success story. And the vast majority of economists today understand that at least in some contexts, uh, the standard economic model needs to be expanded to incorporate psychological elements that were traditionally missing from economics. My own work has been um, recently focused on biases and beliefs, so mistakes that people make in reasoning about probability and statistics. Uh, some of that uh, has carried over into thinking about statistical inference that economists and other researchers make and whether they are correctly drawing conclusions from their own uh, experimental results. I also do work on measuring well-being through survey questions, uh, so trying to think about how you would create an index of well-being that could be tracked over time that would incorporate a broader set of facets of well-being beyond what's captured by standard economic uh, indicators. And genoeconomics, which is linking DNA with behavior and uh, economic outcomes and thinking about how economists and other social scientists could use genetic data to improve uh, their own research. One reason why economists have become interested in subjective well-being or happiness, measures of happiness or life satisfaction, uh, which are asked through survey questions, is that they can capture more of what people care about than more narrow measures of what people consume or what, kind of, what income they earn, which only measures market goods or market consumption. But my, my colleagues and I have investigated the, the possibility that happiness or life satisfaction measures, do they capture everything that people care about? And what we find uh, is that they don't, they don't seem to. It seems that when you ask people how happy they are, they aren't fully accounting for their family's happiness or social status or sense of control in their lives or meaning in their lives. Those things which people care about aren't fully incorporated into their answers about their own happiness. And so even though happiness and satisfaction may be a broader measure of what people care about than consumption or income, it's not a complete measure of what people care about. That's led my colleagues and, and I to think about how to measure these other aspects of well-being that seem to be missed by the subjective well-being measures themselves and how then we might be able to combine multiple survey questions that ask about different things that people care about in their lives together into a composite measure of well-being. Genoeconomics is the use of genetic data in economic and social science research. And there's a number of ways that genetic data can be useful for research. For example, if we have a, uh, a predictor that we can create from, from genetic data, so you spit into a test tube and we send it to a lab and we, we genotype it, we get a measure of genetic variation across the genome, and from that we construct a variable that we can use to predict your education, say, your educational attainment. Today, based on our latest results, we can predict 12, 13 percent of the variation across people in their educational attainment from that kind of measure. That's a pretty powerful predictor that we could then use in any kind of research study where a, having a control variable would be helpful. So for example, if you do a study um, where you provide free preschool to kids and you want to look at the effects on uh, educational achievement, having a, a variable that absorbs 13% of the variance means that you can get a lot more statistical power out of the same study design. And that can be extremely useful when you have a, an expensive study. There's, there's other examples, lots of examples of ways that genetic data could be useful in research. But a first step is that we need to know how to construct these predictors. We need to know which genetic variants are related to economic behavior. So much of my work in genome economics to date has been on that prior step of trying to figure out which genetic variants are linked to behaviors and outcomes.
The single biggest challenge in genome economics to date has been sample size. The early studies, and there were a number of pioneers in doing social science genetics, did laboratory studies with, with sample sizes of a few hundred individuals and trying to link genetic variation with behavior. What we know now is that given the magnitude of the associations between individual genetic variants and complex behavioral traits that economists are interested in, like risk-taking or educational attainment, th those effects are extremely small, and the sample sizes that you need to detect them are 100,000 people or more. The challenge has been how to uh, assemble sample sizes that big. And so the work that my colleagues and I have been doing over the last um, seven years or so is putting together a consortium of researchers. It's called the Social Science Genetic Association Consortium. And it's a cooperative enterprise with medical geneticists and statisticians and sociologists, highly interdisciplinary. Uh, and we are assembling all of the genomic data that we can find that is linked to behavioral traits and economic outcomes in specific studies that we can then jointly analyze them uh, and get the sample sizes that we need in order to identify these associations between genetic variants and behavioral outcomes. Genome economics and social science genomics more generally is a challenging area one reason being that there's a long bad history of mixing social science and genetics that we, those of us in this field, always need to have at the top of our minds. There's also a lot of misconceptions. For example, people think that if you find a gene that is related to a behavior or, say, related to educational attainment, then you're somehow implying that it's deterministic, that if you have a particular variant of the gene, then you will get more educated. If you don't have it, then you won't get more educated. That's just not true. A lot of genetic effects, particularly genetic effects that matter for behavioral traits, operate through a long, complex causal chain that very likely involves environmental components as part of the causal chain itself. So there, you can't even really cleanly separate uh, genes and environment. For example, suppose that a gene that is predictive of education matters because the gene leads you to be a more curious person. Um, and that means that as a child, you read more books. That in turn um, gives you a little tiny advantage in school, and that advantage multiplies over time and you end up um, ultimately getting more education. Well, is that a genetic effect? Well, yes, in a sense. It was a gene that was ultimately kicking off that causal chain. But it's also an environmental effect because the reason you were getting more education is because you read more books as a kid. And so it could be that an intervention like providing more books could lead to more education for other people. So it's both a genetic and an environmental effect. And that genetic effect would completely disappear in, an, in a different environment where books weren't available to kids, and then that gene wouldn't be related to education. So we need to be very careful with, uh, with how we interpret genetic associations. And that's something that my colleagues and I have tried to be very careful about when we're doing this work. In all of the major papers that we've written in this area, we've accompanied the papers with a frequently asked questions document that talks through issues of interpretation, tries to um, minimize the possibility of people uh, interpreting the results as deterministic or mistakenly thinking that the effects of individual genes are large because they, they never are. They're extremely small for behavioral traits. And we want to talk through some of the social and ethical issues like um, the, the possibility of discrimination that people worry could potentially come out of, of research like this. And, you know, I, my own view is work that we're doing um, could be very well used to reduce inequality in society and, and help uh, do studies on uh, interventions to improve outcomes for disadvantaged uh, children. That's what motivates me to do this work. But, you know, we need to be highly attentive to the possibilities for misuse and misinterpretation. To date, 
we've been limited in what outcomes we can study by which outcomes and behaviors we could get large enough samples to be able to do reliable studies. We've studied educational attainment. Uh, that was the, the first flagship project that we initiated, and that happened to be available in large samples because in medical genetics research, education was measured as a background variable in studies of cardiovascular health and cancer and, and everything else, and we could exploit that to use it as an outcome variable. We've also studied um, fertility, which is like number of children that people have and the age at which they have their first child. We've studied subjective well-being, measures of happiness or life satisfaction, and related outcomes like depression and the personality trait neuroticism. We're currently doing a very large scale study of risk tolerance, of people's willingness to take risks. I think economists are pretty remarkable among social scientists in general about being open-minded in terms of um, what ideas they're willing to consider if there's sufficient evidence. On the other hand, economists tend to demand a pretty high bar in terms of usefulness of the ideas for doing their own kind of research or pursuing economic questions that, um, you know, that have traditionally been part of economics. Behavioral economics, I think, broke into the mainstream ultimately when it was able to prove that it could be applied to policy or that the models were sufficiently developed that they could be incorporated into uh, economic theory. The same challenge is going to apply to genoeconomics. You know, right now, a, a lot of it is at the basic science level of identifying associations, building uh, polygenic predictors from data across the genome. And the point at which it will break through into mainstream economics will be the point where it's become sufficiently developed that we can apply it across a range of economic problems.